Thank you so much for joining the Nature of Business Foundations of Ecology and Economy. I had so much fun doing the research for this class that I know that you're going to get so much value out of this. And hopefully it shifts your perspective on what it means to engage in exchange. Um, we're going back to the origin of exchange, which happens in nature. We're looking at energy exchanges. Um, the tenets of the course today are to be looking at um, the creation of life. We're looking at universal intelligence. And um, I have my notes for me to reference, keep me on schedule. My goal is to um, keep this under an hour, 45 minutes if I can, and just fill you with all of this perspective essentially. So have your journal ready to be taking notes, to um, reflect in your own space on these concepts. And um, before we get started with the more um, tangible information, I just want to drop us into our bodies so that we can be in a fully receptive mode. Um, Deepak Chopra is a pioneer of what is called mindfulness-based stress reduction, and it's the, the foundation of my meditation practice is to not be operating on overdrive because it's not an efficient space. It's not efficient for your brain, it's not efficient for your body, and it's not efficient for our work. So um, go ahead and center your self in your seat. Find um, where you're connecting with your chair. Feel that support and go ahead and close your eyes. Witnessing just the blackness behind your eyelids and um, noticing your breath as we come into stillness. And taking a moment and just perceiving any light you can feel, see behind your eyelids, through your eyelids. Inhaling through your nose. Exhaling through your mouth. Audibly, if you'd feel like it, just releasing anything up to this point in your day. And as you stare into the back of your eyelids, just perceive and detect the many molecules that make up your eyelid. You might notice white noise. Taking a round of breath here. And now zooming out just a little bit and detecting the shape of your eye, sensing the space that you can see that circular oval space, that shape that it takes up. And now feeling into uh, <laughs> the musculature of your eye, what's looking and just sensing those muscles. And again, taking a round of breath as you feel into that, inhaling through the nose and exhaling through the mouth. And give your eyes the instruction to relax now. Imagine any tension melting into the, the back of your head. You can picture an ice cube feeling that whole optical nerve release and let go. Bringing your awareness behind your eyes into the brain space, taking a step back, expanding your awareness into the whole cranium and inhaling into it and exhaling. <sighs> And 
And for this next round, bringing your attention to the base of your skull, all the way to the back of your head. Relaxing your neck and shoulders and pausing at this occipital joint where the neck and the head meet. And just bringing your awareness here and breathing into this space. Maybe stretching the back of the neck, tilting the chin down, sensing the, the opening of this joint and allowing your awareness to just rest in the darkness here. Go ahead and just be with yourself for three more rounds of breath. Just sensing the space. This is where the spinal cord is connecting all of your bloodstream and minerals to your brain function, to the flow of your mental space. Last one, in and out, through the nose this time. This is the space of pure creation. This is where all life is born. This is infinite darkness. And it's where creation lives. So allowing your eyes to land on the ground, allowing your eyelids to open and receive light, and coming back into this space, maybe rolling your shoulders back and welcome to the nature of business. In today's class, we're going to be, going to be diving into the energetics of how value is created in nature. Like I mentioned, we're also exploring how it takes form from this void of potentiality. And my goal for the, for this, next hour is for you to gain a conceptual and visceral understanding of intrinsic and organic value exchanges that occur all around us in a circular dynamic okay so kicking us off i'm not sure if um anyone watching this, if you have ever watched a documentary on black holes, but one of my favorite things to imagine is the nebulas, which are essentially just clouds of dust in outer space, right? Um, where stars are born. This is where Things are just electric and kinetic, okay? And just like nebulas in space on Earth, we have marshlands, which are largely noted as unvaluable, except for the key um, species that are often living in these marshlands that require them to be protected. So marshlands for us mean that we can't build structures on them, but in nature, they're a source of this infinite potentiality where creation can emerge. It's, you know, the primordial soup of which, you know, all life springs. And um, marshes are denoted to be murky and inundated with slow moving, shallow waters. Um, the vegetation is often soft stemmed and adapted to these saturated soil conditions. So it's, it's very underwater, it's under cover, it's in the dark that these um, really important uh, energy exchanges are happening to create new life. We also can see this in uh, volcanic systems where 
um, some of our most valuable diamonds and gemstones have come from the underbelly of volcan volcanic ash. The hardest of substances, the most reflective and refractive of light. Okay, so this is this is real life. I am often dismissed as like an energetic junkie and these are real concepts that take place all around us. So this darkness is a place of rapid expansion and energy exchange. Like I said, it's kinetic energy. It's unseen, unrealized potential. And that also lives in your imagination. Okay. Um, yeah, unbeknownst to the naked eye, the darkness is the opposite of a blank slate. It is everything all together. It is um, the infinite combinations that could be, but have not yet decided to be. Okay. So yes, I'm fascinated by black holes and creation and these areas of darkness that the unseen emerges into form. So from the largest energy exchanges like the Big Bang when our sun was created and the earth and our whole solar system um, to the simplest of transmutations like household composting, just, you know, putting our food in a bucket and letting it rot into nutritious soil. It's literally where magic happens. And maybe that's why it's terrifying. It is, it's not sensible, right? Human experience is limited by these senses that are amazing and very intelligent, but also we don't understand through these senses what's happening. So it, it doesn't feel like we're capable of grasping and collaborating um, with this force, but it's an action all around us and it is, it is functional. It is serving a function for us whether we partake in it or not. So what function is it? It's the function of regeneration. Matter cannot be created or destroyed in this reality, in this existence. And that says that everything comes from what was. And so to be regenerated is a natural organic process that everything has gone through. You and me have gone through <laughs> a form of regeneration um, just by being cells in our mother's wombs. So this is where the end of form meets the beginning of a new form. It's the formless, it's the omnipresent, it's transient, right? So what does this have to do with economy, you might wonder. Well, ecology and economy come from the same root word, the Greek word echos or oikos, O-E-K-O. -E um, and both words evolved from this root word meaning household. So ecology is the study of household and the economy is the enacting of maintaining household. Um, and this is important to recognize because these concepts stem from our desire for an individual experience to be controlled and um, for our immediate, you know, circle of influence to have security and safety. This is such a human thing that we um, have overcomplicated, in my opinion. It's just grown and evolved over time as things do. And ecology is a science um, that came in the early 1900s, late 1800s, um, and was officiated by Fred Clements, who um, wrote about plant succession, which essentially denoted how different 
species of plants would change based on their proximity to water and their environment, the climate of their environments. So, you know, high altitude plants look different than the same species of plant that were at lower altitudes. And he um, depicted this in his, in his works. And um, the evolution of plants is really just the, the um, influence of the environment was a big factor in how our ecology evolves. And that's important to know because um, you've heard of conditioning. An environment is an influence that's, that could be considered conditioning, but it's also inevitable. We're all in an environment of some sort and there's multiple layers to explore of what that environment looks like, right? Um, in a plant's environment, say, there's heat, there's moisture, um, there's weather, there's, there's considerations of different proportions that influence and impact how it grows and what it needs to do to adapt and survive, right? And so the science, the, the science of ecology is really the relationship of living organisms to their environment, to the external world, right? So um, the difference of a bloom in the desert versus the difference of blooms in an England, English garden, right? The, rose, <laughs> the roses are different and the, the cactus flowers are so different. So it's just to note that we are shaped by our environments and um, this concept of ecology was actually founded by um, Ellen Swallow in 1892. And, you know, females did not get a lot of credit for their works back in the day. So it wasn't recognized until Fred Clements published his works that ecology was a science to be explored. And I do think it's, it's interesting um, to just presence that women have a really natural connection to nature. Um, there's a philosopher I really enjoy, um, Carolyn Merchant, who speaks to the bell jar experiment and um, how it's depicted in history through a single photograph of women if you're not familiar with the bell jar, it's not it's not something I've um, go into deep here, but it's interesting to just see the different gender reactions to this experiment, where um, they essentially are controlling the air in a tube for um, an animal to live or die, and just um, women are innately empathetic in our action and we, we have a hard time separating you know life sen sentience from work and there's good reason for it um so not unlike plants humans are subject to our own environmental influences and um these all these studies denote is the organism or the or organismic nature of community. We function as organisms, but then the community also functions as an organism. Okay, so um, an ecosystem is a system of households comprised of organisms, and then they get to the population, and then the population is a community. So um, just organisms in quantity become community and all these organisms have unique functions much like humans communities and populations um i reference in my notes the song by justin bieber that's quite popular um i get my peaches out in georgia our regions are known for their functions right So this is like the function of that ecosystem. It produces really good peaches. And just, we're gonna follow this rabbit hole for a minute, okay? So considering the relationship between ecology and economy, let's follow, let's follow the Georgia peach. 
So uh, looking at a peach tree, it takes about two to four years before they actually produce any fruit. And the we're gonna explore some functional and structural relationships that allow a, a peach tree to grow into what we buy at the supermarket, right? So the pit of a peach, we start with just the seed and um, the non-peach is planted into the soil, under the ground, into the darkness. And this plant is then nourished by the soil, any dead plant matter, any broken down bacteria or fungi. Um, peach trees like sandy and well-drained soil. So if you want to just picture that. Um, and the, the plant requires a lot of sunlight. They like full sunshine and this energy exchange is what allows the plant to grow as well. Without the sunlight, the other nutrients would not be as wouldn't be absorbed either. So it's a, it's a dynamic exchange. Okay. And, um, the habitat Um, will require some, you know, form of security and safety for the peach tree to not be destroyed um, by flooding or what else could it be destroyed by? Animals. There needs to be some level of protection for the peach tree to thrive, but it also just needs time and space to properly scale itself. Um, there's a size that this peach tree has a maximum capacity for. And if we plant this peach tree within two inches of another peach pit, um, they would be in competition for nutrients and one would probably overpower the other, not allowing it to grow to its fullest capacity. So ample space and you know patience of time is also a structural need of this plant to be able to scale fully. Um, because too small of an environment would limit its production, right? It would limit how many peaches it's able to grow, how many branches it's able to grow. Um, and in Georgia specifically, um, we're noticing that the red clay is really what is what's supporting the world-renowned or nationwide renowned peaches and their sweetness um, as well as the moderate humidity of being so close to um, well being on the east coast in general <laughs> so um, Colorado also has some of these features and also has really good peaches <laughs> but not not to the degree that Georgia peaches are known and once they are fully grown, ready to be, once they're fully in production, um, they're picked by humans and that time has a price or a value, a monetary value to it. And the land that the tree is being grown on has a monetary value to it. And um, I did a, a small math story problem for us. Not that you have to solve it. I'm just going to talk us through <laughs> through this. Um, so peaches are picked and they're usually tran like transported and then sold by the crate. And so it's about $30 a crate for a crate of peaches. Each crate of peaches is about 25 pounds. And each tree can create uh, up to like 150 pounds of peaches, right? And so there's direct ecology that feeds our economy. And if we, if we only measure the monetary value of the land and the time of the humans, the, the investments of the human level, the things that we can sense, we're really discrediting and undervaluing all of the exchange that's happening beneath the surface and intrinsic to what it takes to grow, right? We're not giving the sun its value. We're not giving the soil its value. Uh, we're just kind of saying, thanks for your free work. Do that again next year. And we're not, we might account for like buying new, so buying new soil um, 
but there's still a gap in our what is our ROI or our evaluation of what's what's being invested and what's our return on our investment. So this is a, a real life story problem that we've come to realize we didn't solve right the first time. So this is the, the creation of life. So sorry, the creation of life is the creation of profit ultimately is what my point is. <laughs> Um, and this is one reason the community garden movement is a really powerful way of reclaiming, <laughs> pun intended, the low hanging fruit of economic power for local economy. Um, fruit and vegetables being grown locally, um, as well as native vegetation and plant species is so valuable for our local economy it's priceless okay priceless um understanding the functions of nature requires this objective non-judging mind though um to come to an unbiased conclusion on what the true value is um when we're talking about beings in an ecosystem that aren't human Um, I recently did a Cobb and Adobe workshop over the summer and um, I found it so insightful that before any traditional Cobb structures were built, they often would observe the land for all four seasons, so a full year before they actually built anything so that they could understand the dynamics of the ecology. Um, you know, where does the rain puddle? Where does, where do things drain? How does the soil react um, in every season? So these are all very important things to take into consideration when we're thinking about adding value to a marketplace or even creating a business model. Um, so continuing on from there to talking more about the origin of exchange. Um, yeah, ecology and economy are essentially a formula for the ROI that we've never established before. We've never established the value of rainwater or soil matter, organic soil matter, like from the land, not whatever we make at Lowe's. Um, <laughs> And not because they don't have a value, but just because it's it's not within our sensibility to evaluate these things. Um, and so catching up with my notes here, <laughs> did everybody, did you happen to notice the Earth Overshoot Day? This was the first year that it's been brought to my attention that we have such a calculation to um, assess where our resources have over, where we're overshooting our resource replenishment. Um, so they've named this our bio capacity, which describes what I like to call a resource replenishment. Um, so this website, it's really valuable to go check out the language they're using. Um, when it comes to ecology and economy, they're using them very much like I am here, where they are not separate. And so Earth Overshoot, um, day just denotes how far removed we are from calculating nature into our business models and into our economy and how detrimental that is ultimately to the economy it's not it's not like the economy sits up in a cloud on a mountain away from reality it is a concept humans derived and it's on shaky ground because it's not giving our resources the value they deserve. So we're struggling with this and it's seen across farmlands uh, in the US specifically that we're struggling with soil health because we don't know the sufficient timelines or care required to replenish the soil's nutrients. And we've, you know, done things of harm that go against um, this regeneration 
process. You know, we're killing the weeds that would be lending to the filtration and uh, reseeding of this nu nutrients uh, in the soil. So biologists do know how to replenish soil, but our farmers don't, oddly enough. Um, ecologists are informed, but economists are so far removed that they have no idea. And to me, if you're an investor and you don't understand ecology, you're just playing with an abacus. You're just playing with your calculator. <laughs> and you can't eat a calculator. Um, so the goal is to close the gap between ecology and economy and remember that they are one. And remember that the origin ex of exchange begins in the soil and we must, we must honor this principle to continue to thrive as a society. Um, so just taking a moment to acknowledge that big, the bigness of that and letting you have a moment to process. So, um... Again, finding your seat, finding a center, centering space on your chair, feeling that connection to your chair, feeling supported by your, by your environment right now, and going inward for just another moment and allowing your eyes to land on the floor. You don't necessarily have to close your eyes. You can keep them just focused on a low, a low space on, on the floor. Um, and just kind of move your body a little bit, shake it out if you need, stretch your neck. And um, I just want you to take a, a pulse check of your current quality of awareness. Do you feel on? Do you feel tired? Do you feel overwhelmed? Do you feel checked out? Are you depleted from the day, the week, the year? Are you bright-eyed? Are you motivated? Just what's the quality of life that's surging through you at this moment? And again, coming to it with that non-judging mind of all is, all is valuable here. And then just bringing to awareness what your sleep quality has been like recently. Last night, how'd you sleep? How have you been going to sleep? Have you been going to sleep well, easy? Has it been difficult? You can Take a moment and note any of the things that are coming up for you in your journal around your existing sleep routine. Um, this is the function of regeneration in our human system. Um, this is where we can actually viscerally feel what it's like to regenerate energy. Our cells lay dormant while we allow our nervous system to do its thing. Our organs are resting. This is what gives us life. <laughs> we know how it feels to be exhausted and there's forms of torture that don't allow humans to sleep. I'm pretty sure a lack of sleep can be fatal. And our ability to produce in that state is limited. And this is just to say that we can empathize with the soils, with the resources that aren't getting their just time to regenerate. 
Um, and another example I will share is one that I can't resist bringing up because it is so human of us to have such a powerful experience and then to belittle it completely. And that's the power of an orgasm. Um, what a space of mystery for so many people. And it's also a space where life is created, like procreation is created in that space. And it's also priceless. We don't have necessarily the price of, of a baby. Um, and um, it's interesting because sex work, if we were to put this back into economy from the ecology, it's barred, right? It's illegal. We're not allowed to trade sex for money. It's too sacred by whoever made that law. I don't, I don't know that I have an opinion one way or another, but just for the, the sake of this conversation, it's interesting to take note that it's a protected force of purity and primal exchange. It's part of sustaining our ecosystem as humans. So this is important as it, it pertains to the idea of a healthy and prosperous household. This other functions of the household that have existed beyond the economic structures we know today, like we're going before cars, before chemical manufacturing, before the big, you know, industrial revolutions, households and economy have existed in many different ways. Um, old school pottery was really big, you know, sculpting clay. Uh, food and livestock trades and exchanges, you know, two pigs for your one cow. Um, hunters and gatherers. I actually, I'll, I'll pause on, we'll come back to that one. I have a story on that one. Um, marriage dowries is a really, is an interesting one because we do get into the human experience there. Um, where a husband or a potential husband, suitor, would propose good, um, his farm animals for marriage. You know, he would have an offering to take your, your hand in marriage and he would propose it to your family. <laughs> but the, the marriage dowries is, is an interesting one. Um, one that's a little more intrinsic is um, the tradition of praying over our food. You know, this may not feel like an exchange, but it, it is an energetic exchange of attention, intention, and um, electromagnetic force. Our hearts, the ones beating inside your chest, um, that organ is 5,000 times more powerful of an electromagnetic vibration than our brain waves. So extending energy from the heart space is actually pretty powerful and measurably so. And so to um, receive food from our ecology and to exchange from a place of heart is, is tradition that goes back a far way, right? We're talking tribal days. Um, even um, considering like sacrifices to the gods, right? Human or <laughs> livestock um, in ceremony, this has been a way to ask for things or make requests to the larger um, ecosystem, the universal intelligence, if you will. So coming back to hunter-gatherers, I think it's really interesting to think about, you know, going to 
um, someone who's a gatherer and someone who's a hunter and finding ways to exchange there too. Like, oh, I've gathered all of these berries. What did you hunt today? And finding a way to, to balance each other out because you like just eating meat isn't that exciting and just eating berries isn't that exciting. But when you are able to make an exchange, there's balance, there's harmony, there's life giving nutrients. Remember, it's a dynamic exchange. It's not just a single exchange. Um, and this is also something we can witness in our own internal systems through our digestive process. Um, and our internal processing of food um, creates nutrients whether we want to acknowledge it or not. We're not absorbing everything we eat. We are absorbing some things and um, we excrete the rest. Now, what's also happening in our system, because there's these layers of energy exchange happening, is that um, a, a big thermodynamic process is also happening as we ingest food. Our body is warming to um, work harder to make that digestion process happen. So this is why when it's hot outside, we eat less. Um, and yeah, we warm, we, our bodies warm to help aid the digestion and breakdown of food. And then when we actually go to the bathroom, um, we release all of that heat too with our excrement. So it's really interesting that we're also, we're having an energy exchange outside of just the, the matter, the physical matter that's happening because heat and um, heat is a form of energy that's sensible. We can sense it, but it's not visible. We can't sell it. <laughs> well, in some ways there's, there's industries that have created solutions for that, right? Um, HVAC, um, they've, they found a way to harness, um, like fireplaces, things like that. We have, we have, um, found a way to put a value on that system. All right. So one thing I do want to come back to in this um, exchange as we explore like different household dynamics that denote economy, right? We're talking about economic exchanges in the household, in the local communities. Um, before we got, you know, eight levels deep in corporate America, <laughs> um, things were simpler and value was more abundant, I would argue. Um, and so I have a lot of options here <laughs> on tangents I can go on, but for right now, for the sake of time, um, I will include them in later lessons. <laughs> I guess one really easy one to speak to really quick would be um, the selling of water, right? As we've gotten into modern age, we decided, well, before we even started selling water, we started managing water. You know, we came up with windmills and um, ways to use water in a way that created value in our economy before we sold it um, and made it easier and simpler. So convenience started becoming a value, T saving time was a value, um, and water is heavy. <laughs> um, I was watching Zac Efron's Down to Earth series and there's an episode of them experiencing what it's like to trek water. I think it's like two miles back and forth to this village that this like 15 year old girl does almost every day. And I myself really enjoy gathering water at this spring that I, it's about a half a mile, but it took me probably three or four trips before I could take two jugs 
two gallons and get it down by myself without <laughs> physical distress. And on a hot day, it's distressing still. It's uphill. Um, yeah, it just is. So um, the selling of water was an, an inevitable um, point of exchange. You know, if you have easier access and I have something of value, that that's something that would evolve and it makes sense too. Which leads us to um, talking more about the planetary commons. So the planetary commons would be resources that we're all, we all inherited by being born essentially. We all inherited um, the resources of this earth and we're all responsible for taking care of them. So this includes fire, like gold, water. Um, I'd love for you to just reflect on what other things that you can think of. Um, we've talked about soil being one of them, the sunshine. We, we have very limited ability to care for the sunshine, but managing sunshine we can, we can do. Um, one that I feel is pretty important is our oceans and our atmosphere. So the key points about ecosystem functions are the harnessing of energy and the continual recycling of material. So in natural systems, the primary energy source is sunlight and recycling is accomplished by a variety of regenerative processes. Some of them physical, some of them chemical, some of them biological. Um, and the water cycle is a powerful um, resource on Earth. It's present in all environments on Earth. Um, it's this life-giving substance we can't find on any other planet in this function, in, in this dynamicism that it's, pr it's presently operating in on Earth. Um, whichever way we tell the story of creation, whether you believe in a Big Bang or something more miraculous, um, or something more mundane, um, we have have to recognize that water came from the universe and is still out there. Um, so like who owns water? Like I said, it's it's a evolutionary commons. It's a planetary commons, excuse me. Um, we all own water. We're all responsible for stewarding the water cycle and protecting its it's precious energy exchange that it it functions for all of the different purposes and relationships that it encourages um yeah so part of my notes go into who owns water but like better yet what structures are responsible for water and what functions does water serve so we could say like structures that are responsible for water would include, I don't know, gravity, <laughs> the sun, it has, you know, the power to help it evaporate, um, melt, all of that stuff. The moon is a function or a structure, sorry, of water. The tides of the ocean are, are impacted by the moon and its gravity. Um, and the earth itself, right? <laughs> the continental shifting of land impacts the water and our elevation rise and fall impacts the water. A topography essentially is a function or sorry, a structure of water. And um, as far as like what functions does it serve? I mean, it's life-giving. It serves so many functions. I don't know that we could name them all. Um, hydration obviously is 
a key function. It serves, it plumps cell, cellular um, structure up. You know, we're 80% water. <laughs> we would be raisins without it. And um, it's interesting because we can even look at this on an economic scale, like who pays for <laughs> the natural disasters that happen? Our tax dollars. Our tax dollars go to fund and rebuild anything damaged by um, inclement weather. And if we didn't have government, we would still all be responsible for repairing what damages were done by water. Because we all benefit from water otherwise. So we, we respect the dynamic nature of water in this way. Um, yeah, there's a lot to be said about like water distribution and land distribution. Um, but again, we're going to pin that for another lesson because I want to get to, um, this idea of goods versus services. So, um, my personal positioning <laughs> on our economic definitions of goods and services um, is that they all actually are services because we're not creating any of these resources unless we start selling our own poop. That's a product that we made. <laughs> um, we're selling the service of fetching oil and finding oil and extracting oil. We're getting paid for um, the service of manufacturing water bottles and bottling the water. We're not pay we're not getting paid for the water. We didn't pay for the water. We just went out and, and used our time and energy to collect it. So to me, every every way I look at it, any product being sold as a good is actually just a service in disguise. Um, which is interesting because we're taxed on products and not services, um, sales tax wise. So you might reposition how you sell your stuff if that's your industry. Anyways, um, my point in going down this rabbit hole is to just to say <laughs> Um, aside from my personal beliefs, the materials themselves are not accounted for in our modern ROIs, return on investments, and resource replenishment would require the knowledge of the rate of return for every individual mineral and component of energy exchange we use to create the good. Um, we'd have to measure the thermodynamics, we'd have to measure more than is worth probably. Right? Like, there becomes a point when understanding something is just out of reach and out of efficient use of time and resources. Um, we, we see this in toddlers. It's like, they ask why so much, and to a point, you just go, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the why is irrelevant. It just is. Um, and I think we could all take a dose of that. <laughs> every once in a while, um, especially when it comes to like space exploration. I think we all are, are very humbled by the idea of not knowing what's out there in space. And yet we crave to know. And to me, it's just a matter of coming to terms with our human scope of existence. Like our scope of existence may not to be to understand the whole laws of the universe. Um, but we can come as close as possible. I don't think that um, it negates our experience on Earth to not understand everything. So, and that's coming from somebody who really, really, really wanted to know. No, I just really wanted to know everything when I was younger. I really wanted to understand things to the nth degree. And it just 
isn't necessary and you're you'll burn yourself out trying to get there <laughs> you'll exhaust your resources our resources getting there um so moving on into universal intelligence um universal intelligence is my way of describing that kinetic field of energy and speaking to the synthesis of star matter or the synthesis of an organism or it's just like the gravitational pull that brings life into existence and it's not something that I have a name for other than universal intelligence or yeah energetic momentum is another way I've described it in the past um, it's it's where genius lives. Um, it's where the spark happens in, it's not even in, it's between molecules and cells. Um, it's these polarizing forces of electro electricity and magnetism, the electromagnetic forces that just exist within all beings at different rates, right? We all have a level of gravity to our being, um, if you didn't know. And that level of gravity is what brought us here, is what brought us into creation. And this concept of universal intelligence really goes back to um, what is described in You Are the Universe by Deepak Chopra as the art of refinement. And I love this term so much because I imagine the infinite void as um, molecules like puzzle pieces and you, you may have learned this in chemistry that they all have a certain number of ions and protons that are looking for a right fit and so they're just like all these molecules bouncing off of each other like do you fit do you fit do you fit and it's this law the law of probability that even einstein was is renowned for or sorry thomas edison is renowned for um which is to find a hundred ways to not for something to not work right he experimented so much until the law of probability or the art of refinement worked in his favor, worked in the giving of form to an idea. And this is our last section. We're just about to wrap up here, but this concept is so tangible when you really think about it. Um, and it's, it's true, if the universe has infinite combinations of reality available, if, if um, life could just spontaneously combust from all interactions, um, it would be really sporadic, right? But because we have some electromagnetic forces that enact the creation of life, that um, spark genius or spark that universal intelligence to say yes we do actually have a match here where something can be formed um, it's to say like nothing is on accident and nothing is on purpose like everything's always trying to um, everything's just always bumping up against each other out of possibility of creating something which we can experience in our own thoughts. Our thoughts happen, I think it's like 70,000 thoughts a day or something. And you know, the synapses in our brain is really just trying to come to some information that, <laughs> that um, enables action, that allows evolution in the next step forward. So. Um, we have our own dynamic forces within us, right? We have ego, we have identity, we have um, other emotions that can play a role like the, the observer mind. Um, and it is what 
creates our function of how we allow that process to evolve. If we are, um, seeing a lack of diversity in thought, we will have the same bad habit happen over and over again, like nail biting, for example. Um, I'm just thinking like, oh crap, I always bite my nails. And then, you know, that inevitably I start to bite my nails. But if I start to think of other thoughts that lend to other actions, other um, beliefs, I can find other ways to, like, I'm inspired to, to behave differently. So, yeah, this is where we make something out of nothing. And going back to that occipital joint, that is where a lot of the information and, and um, blood flow from the marrow, from the spinal cord all meet into our brain and and i like to believe that's where our imagination lives so um it's just an, a principle of life that energy follows intention um beyond like you know after the electromagnetic pulses that happen intention is our own conscious way of directing gravity. Remember, our heart has all of that electromagnetic power in it. And intention, I believe, is, is an idea of the heart, is a, a purposeful, um, purposeful momentum. It's energetic momentum, but with consciousness as a, a collaborator. Um, so yeah, just to wrap this up, energy follows intention and the gravity of in ener the gravity of energy or the gravity of an idea gains momentum. Um, the more we think about it, the more, um, iterations we give it, the more repetition we give it, the more opportunities it has to take form. Um, and also gain more collective wisdom because as form regenerates, it's not necessarily wiping a blank slate on the DNA level. There's still an intelligence that's carried through as form takes new form, right? And this is why I don't think, um, I can't think of the word right now. Um, yeah, it's not coming to me. Not important, I guess. Um, I really do trust universal intelligence at a, a macro level. I want to end this. Let's see. I Let me just read my notes really quick. I get really nerdy at the end here. Um, so yeah, just speaking to energetic momentum and the wisdom that's collected through this regenerative process, it's, it's a potent value exchange that happens when um, form becomes formless and takes new form because the, the intelligence gets scattered. Not all of the same cells that were in the original form go into the next form. Okay, and this is why interdependence and ecosystems are what forms community. We rely on the universal intelligence beyond the individual intelligence to create something larger than ourselves. We only have so much gravity for our own intentions, but when we can decide and agree on a collective intention, the energetic momentum is larger, quicker, more effective and efficient and um, more probable mathematically, okay? Um, <laughs> the 
So you can you can just understand this on an individual level where um, if I say picture the color green, you might picture just a green ball of energy, but it's more likely that you're thinking of something that is green. Um, and you can journal it down. If we were all together, we could probably all name something that came to mind and there would be more than one person naming something similar, right? Plants, tree, um, a caterpillar, I don't know. <laughs> we, we would probably find repetition in our experience, right? That's universal intelligence too. Um, so I, I'm a fan of balance and I've given you a lot of intellect to digest um, and I want to share two poems to just give a different experience of these concepts. So feel free to, you can put your journal away or you can be inspired to jot down anything that sparks within you as I read. They're not too long. Um, this first one's actually pretty short. What do we make of sand? Castles. From the smallest granule, a smidge of water. And we create worlds, empires, grandeur. Visionaries live within all of us. The power of humanity is that of nature, split between each of us to decide what to create and what to destroy. In a world of infinite refinement, averages are not enough. We seek efficacy. We seek marvel. We seek connection. We do not create to keep it to ourselves. We wish to share our feats and creations and imagine even more together. All right, and this other one is also somewhat about sand. <laughs> it's just like the smallest piece of matter that's visible to the naked eye. It's like this in between space, you know, an oyster creates a pearl out of a, a piece of sand that ir is irritating it. And yeah, I was really inspired by this material. Um, and like I mentioned, I, um, did the Adobe workshop this last summer and found so much inspiration in just using my hands to make a structure that could last hundreds of years and had, you know, there's, if you don't know much about Cobb and Adobe, it's very insightful to see how old and traditional building processes were so solid, so solid. Um, I was impressed <laughs> by the power of straw, clay, and sand, and a little bit of water. Um, here goes the second one. They don't have a name. I am a castle sculpted by hand from glacial sands, remnants of time past and proof that nothing is ever lost, grounded in my words, my rhythm, my rhetoric, grounded with my breath, my body, my heart. Bury me feet first so I may listen. Sorry, bury me feet first so I may see and listen. Let me be amongst the walls. Plant me, mulch me, drown me in belonging. It is the peace I seek. It is my return to the throne. Find me in the future. Marvel then attention distracts, tilts, and is a potent liqueur I refuse to claim as medicine to any one person in such concentrated doses. Dilute, dilute, dilute. My castle has no roof. I don't even call it a castle. 
for it is a palace, more open, less defenseless, or sorry, less defensive, a space for gratitude and gazing upon the wonders of this world and the stars too. Sift down the sand from the bottom of your local stream, plaster me in mica-soaked muds, see the shimmer and sheen especially when the sun dips below the horizon and the whole room is aglow. Dreamy and calm, fairies live here. I built it for them, for their reprieve from unwanted attention. Held by walls and halls of earth and bones and the open sky. We sleep with the angels, write songs on the breeze, to be noted by the trees and recorded in my ventricles in sync to the throb of my veins. I've grown from a room of my own to a palace to share, seemingly overnight. That's the thing about time and poetry. Without any notice, perception and reality can shift in a given moment. We never install artificial light. It's all torches and candles, illuminating crystals, something enchanted. About what is nameless. Oh, there's something that's enchanted about what is nameless, and I love that. Um, yeah, that's just my musing upon what it was like to envision building my own structure out of, out of cob, out of earth. Hmm. Um, I do have more prose that I'd like to vocalize here. So feel free to come back if you need to, but um, these were, these are potent pieces of wisdom that are relevant. Sai Swoon is a poet who um, published this book, Notes on Shape Shifting, which is a form of energy exchange and what we're talking about, regeneration. Um, and one of her passages um, is and to answer the mystery of stars consuming, digesting, or expelling, stars consume hydrogen and emit helium. The powerful simplicity of this fact speaks of a pure energy, of an empowered internal movement of circulation, of heat. A star is a seemingly still being, but it is far from stagnant and far from death. It churns with an energy powerful enough to endure the darkness. And isn't that what we all want? Um, there's some notes I have about water that I will include in our course notes. So I'll leave you with this final contemplation. What about our own ecology? Can the earth sustain the expanding human population indefinitely at a high quality of life? To what degree are human values compatible with natural values? That is, can natural and managed ecosystems integrate or are preserves the only alternative to completely altered environments dominated by humans and their domesticated species. Um, and that's from a textbook called The Economy of Nature. I was hoping to find numbers in that book. There are no numbers. <laughs> There's no monetary value in that book. <laughs> but it does speak a lot about energy exchange. So... Um, as you continue in exploring what business is really about, I hope you consider these concepts that we've reviewed today 
and I know that there is a earth-based, ease-based way of being in business. And I empower all of us to take a look at what that means and to find what's true for you and where your gravity is. And um, if you haven't already, I urge you to consider joining us in Symbiotic Business School, where we'll be diving into the how, into the creation of your own structures and functions in your own ecosystem and your own local economy so that you can add value into the marketplace in a way that's circular and cohesive and abundant so that we can all have healthy, wealthy communities. Thank you for being, and thank you for being here. <laughs>